Today I want to show you some other ways of preparing for a watercolor painting. What's up friends, Liron here. Thank you for joining me in another video. And this time I want us to look at another way of preparing for watercolor painting. Uh, we're gonna paint this scene here. And um, I already showed you making a preparatory sketch and all of that process. But aside from that, there, there's quite a few things that I do sometimes. Now with this particular scene, for some reason I felt confident in terms of the drawing and the values. I didn't really feel the need to make a study uh, specifically geared towards the values. So I didn't even plan on making a preparatory sketch in this instance. But there are some things I do that will just make sure I get it right uh, despite not practicing on it before. So uh, the first thing is to play around with the reference image and this is something I barely showed so far so I really want to focus on that uh, in this video. So the first thing is again to manipulate the image uh, to get the effect you want that will help you understand how to paint it. That's the first and the second one is color study. Okay, or rather color selection. You, it's, it's more of a matter of choice. Um, so let's start with the first one. And here's again the original reference image. Now one of the first things I do is to turn it into black and white. And I'll show you the example right here. Uh, what black and white does is actually make it easier to see the values. Now I was confident in the values, so I didn't feel the need to sketch this before going into the painting, but I do want to get a better visual image of it. So here we have what the values look like by just turning it into black and white. Now uh, already you can see that there's something interesting going on with the skies and the roof. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, weird value plays and we can decide to leave it as it is or to change things around, maybe simplify things for ourselves, which is something I actually did here. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about that. Now. After I have a better understanding of the values, what I do is use a function in Photoshop called Posterize. And Posterize just takes the amount of values and minimizes it. And you can decide how many there are. You can uh, start at uh, two, I think you can even choose one, or two, it's like a scroll, you scroll up and down and you can have it at one and then it's just all black. Or you can have it at two and then it's uh, dual, like double value, you have black and white. Uh, and then you can gradually add more and more values. If you uh, increase it all the way up, it will just look like the normal picture. I do that for the black and white picture. Again, here's, the, here's an example of what it looks like. So in this example, I reduced it to, I believe, four values or maybe three. This is usually what works for me, four, three, uh, maybe five. And so you can see how the sky goes from gradual from dark um, to, down to light. And this is what creates a bit of confusion around the roof of this uh, rural church. And so what I decided to do is to just uh, abandon this whole idea with the sky and just make them a little lighter than the actual uh, roof of the church or whatever building that is. Um, and so I, this, if I hadn't gone through this process of playing around with the posterize, and by the way, uh, you can do that in image adjustments, I think, and posterize. Um, it, it just a really great tool. Uh, you can get Photoshop PS, PS, I don't remember the name too, uh, for free. I'll put a link maybe in the description box. So anyway, uh, just doing this little function of posterize really helps you understand how the values break down. And then you can have a choice and decide, do I want to pay attention to all of this gradation? Do I want to discard it? You can see how dark the, the mountain range in the background is on the right side and on the left side. Um, it's just a very interesting process to go to. I actually have the, the thing here, so this is why I'm looking down all the time, just out of curiosity. But um, yeah, it's just a really good way of approaching this whole process and having fun with it and manipulating the picture to really understand what goes on there. You can also play with the levels, which is you can do control L uh, on Windows at least, or you can just do uh, image adjustment levels. You can do auto levels, which is supposed, supposed to balance it, or you can play around with the toggles uh, by yourself and see where it takes you. So these kinds of manipulations are 
really, really uh, helpful in deciding on the values. Now, we're done with the values. The next thing we want to do is some color research and to just choose a color scheme. So to do that, I'm going to change the angle now and we're go I'm going to show you just how I do it. It's a very simple process. It depends uh, on, the, on the reference, on, on the effect you're trying to achieve. In this instance, it was rather simple for me to recognize what kind of palette color scheme I want to work with. Okay, so let's change the angle and look at that. So I've got this little piece of uh, paper here. This is actually the Hanemule. And uh, I always have these little uh, pieces of paper laying around uh, in places because I haven't used them for, uh, or maybe it's the back side of a paper I used for practice. And what I want to show you is just uh, how I go over the color selection process. And I approach it uh, very simply in this, in this instance. So uh, when I look at the sky, I feel a little bit of warmth. So I'm making a conscious decision to go with uh, French ultramarine as, as the sky color. Okay, it just feels like the right thing and it, it actually looks pretty similar. Uh, one other thing that I like particularly about this one is if you look at the sky they're a little darker. Uh, but not too dark because if you get the skies dark the whole painting feels blocked off and closed off in an annoying way. So the good thing with this, um, the French Ultramarine, is that it can't go too dark. Unlike for example Thalo Blue which will go really dark. You see this is the darkest I can get. So it will be easy to make sure I don't mess this up. Now as for the greens, I'm going to do something that I haven't done in a while now and I will use Sap Green as my base green. The reason is that I actually look at the reference and it looks pretty Sap Green-ish to me. It looks like the average color. So here we go, some Sap Green. Now, I do want to create some interest and to do that I will add a bit of uh, this yellow here that you can see. Let me show you. Uh, this yellow and I don't even remember which yellow it is I think it can be even a Windsor Newton one uh, but it's just a very nice warm yellow and take a look at how these two combine and it's just a very beautiful result and this is what will allow me to create some uh, variance uh, on the grass. Now if I want to get a gr grass in the distance I can always uh, mix it with the with some uh, French ultramarine and get that same um, uh, a little cooler muted effect. So a bit of French ultramarine in there and then a bit of water just to make it a little more faded and there you go. That's for the grass in the distance. Now uh, another element we have here are the sort of reds. Okay, So one of the dominant ones there it sort of looks like a um, brown red and for this uh, particular instance the burnt sienna will do a good job. So let me show you here. Uh, and these two just work really great, the Burnt Sienna and French Ultramarine. And another use we can have for that is for the roof. So we can just neutralize the roof and create the gray of the roof using these two. Okay, now what I noticed is that when I take a painting too far into uh, this gray area, I tend to gray it all out. So what I will have to make sure I don't do is not gray it all out. So there will be some gray for the structure itself but I have to make sure I preserve the vibrancy of the greens and the yellows and the blues. Okay, because I don't want it all to be muted and as some of you have been following me for a while know, um, too much muting is one of my, was one of my sticking points. Now I'm slowly getting over it. Okay, so this is basically all we need now. We have uh, this sort of a yellow, we have blue, we have a reddish uh, color and we have the base of sap green. One more thing that I want to add to this and it's quite optional but I think I will do it is the pyrrole scarlet that I have here. I think it's pyrrole scarlet not perlin red but the two are very similar so it doesn't really matter you can use either and you see this one is very strong. Uh, the thing I want to may use it for uh, is for flowers or things like this in the foreground that I want to make them pop. Okay so this is basically everything we need here uh, let me just show you a bit more of the yellow because it's a bit lost here with the green. And look at this lovely palette and it actually isn't just three primaries but rather uh, sort of three primaries with the green that's going to be more dominant and another one. Okay, and these work really well together for this particular scene. So you see here, uh, just to conclude this, even if I don't actually make a... Uh, um, 
<laughs> a preparatory sketch like in this example <clears throat> I'm actually doing I can, you can do quite a thorough job with the preparation and make sure you are prepared okay so you don't always necessarily have to sketch in advance if you feel like you've got a good grasp of the values and um, if you feel like the drawing is, is simple for you and for me it's simple I know that for other people it won't be because that's kind of my gift uh, I can very easily uh, paint such things but not everyone's like that so definitely if you feel like you need a preparatory sketch go for it uh, but I do want you to to look at this as an alternative uh, for some extra work you can uh, make as a preparation for the drawing and painting okay so I just wanted to share with you this process um, <clears throat> and let's now change the angle and I will wrap up uh, this video okay friends so I hope uh, this makes things uh, easier for you. You can see that you you basically divide the preparation process into three parts. I would say first one is the drawing, second one is the values, and third one is the colors. Now colors are the simplest, because at least for me and my style, because I don't necessarily try to imitate exactly what I see, and so I can just go uh, go with whatever colors seems right to me, um, and just uh, sort of. Um, I forgot to cast my own color selection onto the, the reference and decide what I want to do with it. Drawing isn't too tricky as well in terms of it's straightforward. If you're going for realism, you're going to try and draw what you see. Uh, values as well, it's a bit tricky in the beginning, but once you get more experience, you can identify the differences. And sure, I have some mistakes uh, in the painting itself, as you will see. I'm actually recording this after finishing the painting, but... Um, you, you may have some mistakes also in your analysis of the values. You're going to learn so much more about the scene by actually painting it. And then if you're not pleased, you can create another version, maybe go for a different color scheme just to make it a little more interesting uh, for yourself. Because for me, I get totally bored by just doing the same, uh, you know, the same scene over and over again. But anyway, I hope this uh, additional way of preparing for a watercolor painting helps you uh, and you can see another side of it. This is something I do to almost any image, at least the black and white. Um, sometimes also the posterize effect. Uh, but the color is not always. Sometimes I just go with my intuition while working on it or I'll just default to one of my uh, regular uh, trios like uh, primary uh, selections that I usually go with. Um, so anyway, yeah, this is it. I hope you enjoyed this video and you learned a lot. It's going to be a part of this uh, sequence of videos that are going to show you now the preparation. The next one will be the actual uh, drawing and painting and time lapse. And afterwards, we're going to have a full narrated video. It's going to be a three videos series, playlist, sequence, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so tomorrow will be the next one, which is the time-lapse video, and I'm really excited for that and also for the narrated version. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Don't forget to subscribe here, follow me on Snapchat and Instagram where I share parts of the processes and some more personal updates, and I will see you again in another video tomorrow.